Hey, hi everyone, and uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, I'm Partha. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Vantage Circle. Uh, we are an employee engagement platform. Uh, we work with HR of different size of companies, uh, trying to solve some of the problems you know around rewards and recognition and on employee engagement uh, space. So much is, has changed in the HR in the in the in the workspace in the last uh, one and a half years, and so much is changing. And we have seen, as Vanity Circle, have seen massive changes in the way. Uh, people are asking the kind of questions they are asking and the kind of challenges they are facing. You know, uh, uh, while each company have has their unique challenges, uh, some of them are pretty common, and that gave us the idea of this webinar series. Uh, we brought in nine speakers, nine eminent speakers, over eight episodes to talk about the challenges, to share their thoughts, and uh, not exactly solutions. But what are the best practices they have seen? How would they solve those kind of problems? So we have this webinar series uh, running from uh, 9th of November to 7th of December. Uh, this is the sixth uh, of the webinar series. And one of those common challenges is, is culture. You know? And I would say it's the biggest challenge. And, and today's topic is around that, around courageous cultures how to build teams of micro innovators, problem solvers, and customer advocates. And I think it's, it's, it's a very pertinent uh, uh, topic, in, particularly in today's hybrid uh, workspace. And, and who better to speak about that than uh, uh, Karen Hurt and David Dye. So Karen and David Dye help uh, human-centered uh, leaders uh, resolve workplace ambiguity and chaos so that they can drive innovation, productivity, and revenue without burning out employees. Uh, as CEO and president of Let's Grow Leaders, that's the name of the foundation uh, or the company which, uh, which they run, they're known for practical tools and leadership development programs that stick. Uh, Karen and David are award-winning authors of books, including Courageous Cultures, which we'll be talking today, uh, Winning Well, which were one of their first books, uh, and uh, we'll be going through those, you know, we'll be, they'll be sharing their thoughts today around that topic and we'll see, you know, and keep your questions coming in. Uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting session. Uh, uh, a former Verizon wireless executive, Karen, has been named as Inc. Magazine's list of great leadership speakers. Uh, David Dye is a former executive and elected official uh, and Interestingly, they have uh, they have a very interesting uh, philanthropic initiative, Winning Wells. It's building clean water wells for the people of Cambodia. Welcome, Karen. Welcome, David. Sorry. Thank you so much for having us. So, so before, you may- before I just hand it over to you, okay, just just a couple of hygiene uh, things which I'll I'll just uh, do. So it's it's going to be about forty five odd minutes. Uh, uh, well, when they will be talking about this topic. Uh, This session is recorded and will be shared with all of you post this uh, event uh, along with your SHRM credits. And and, uh, we'll take the Q&A after that, but keep the Q&A coming in. And uh, over to you, Karen. Perfect. Thank you so much. We're delighted to be here. So you may be curious how we got so curious about this topic of courageous cultures. You see, we were working with organizations all over the world in a variety of industries, and we were noticing a consistent pattern. We would go in and work at the senior most levels of organizations, and we would hear things like this. Why am I the only one that sees these issues? What's wrong with my managers? Why can't they see this stuff and fix it? We've got so many ways for people to submit their ideas. Why don't more people use them? My direct reports are always out talking to employees, but all we get is a bunch of fluff. But you know what's really interesting? We would go in to do training at the frontline supervisor level of these very same organizations, and this is what we would hear. The only way to get the customer what they need is to use this workaround. I have been doing it for years, which is why my customers love me so much. It's not standard procedure though, so I just keep my head down and hope my boss doesn't notice. 
They say they want our ideas, but nothing ever changes. I've stopped bothering. Whenever a big wig comes down from HQ to do a focus group, my boss warns us to only talk about the good stuff so it doesn't look like we're complaining. So employees have ideas and most leaders really do want to hear them. So somehow there was a disconnect. So we set out on an extensive research study uh, in cooperation with the University of North Colorado Social Research Lab to answer this question. When people were holding back ideas, what kinds of ideas were they holding back? And they were not trivial ideas like virtual Taco Tuesdays or kombucha in the break rooms. They were ideas to improve the customer experience, the employee experience, or productivity in a process. And then... If people were holding back those ideas, why? What were the main causes? So today, we're going to share with you a little bit about the research and then some very practical tools to help you tap into the best innovation and problem solving of every team member. So as we start, let's begin here. When we talk about a courageous culture, what do we mean by a courageous culture? And one of the easiest ways to think about a courageous culture is to start by a definition of culture. Our favorite definition of culture comes from Seth Godin, the marketing guru, who defines culture simply as people like us do things like this. It's what people like us do. That's the culture of every team, every organization. It's what what we're doing. In a courageous culture, people like us raise our hand on behalf of the customer. We're solving problems. We're speaking up with solutions and ideas. In contrast, a normal kind of safe culture that exists, people kept their, keep their head down. Silence is considered safe. In a courageous culture, consistent contribution is everything. So we want to take a look at how culture works according to the research. But before we do that, we actually want to hear from you. So I'm going to put a poll up on the screen, and I know that our hosts are going to pop the poll up for you to participate in through Zoom. Which of the following reasons for not speaking up with solutions or ideas do you see most frequently? Is it that people are not asked for their ideas? Is it that people think nothing will happen as a result of their idea? Maybe people don't know how to share their ideas or people think their leader doesn't want new ideas. Or finally, people fear speaking up. So you can choose one of those, whichever one you see most frequently. And once we give it another couple of seconds here. All right. I think that's good. Let's see what our results are like. If we can share the, share the results there. All right. Number one here. People think nothing will happen as a result of their idea. 65%, almost two thirds, followed by people fear speaking up. Well, here is the good news. Thank you for sharing that with us. Here is the good news. Whichever of those results you might have chosen, you're correct. Because here's what we found, and it forms the backbone of courageous cultures, is that first, people aren't asked. No one's asked. They're saying things like, our respondents said, 49% of them said, you know, my leaders are not consistently asking for ideas. And your number one answer is that concern Nothing's going to happen. The thing that you see most frequently, oh, is anything going to make a difference? 50% of respondents said, if I contribute an idea, it won't be taken seriously. And if you've ever felt stuck, not alone. In our research, 67% of respondents said that their manager operates according to the notion, this is the way we've always done it. And finally, was your number two, was fear. And fear takes many forms. One of the ways that that came out in the research was 40% of respondents said they don't feel confident to share their ideas. We refer to this idea of fear as FOSU or fear of speaking up. You might be familiar with fear of missing out. FOSU is one of the things that, that reluctance that keeps people from speaking up. 
Yeah. And so where does this post to come from? So Dr. Amy Edmondson of Harvard, she's really the pioneer of psychological safety, who wrote the foreword to our book, Courageous Cultures. She talks about how people are more likely to hold on to and remember a negative experience that they had than a positive. And why is this so important when you're talking about building a culture where people speak up and feel courageous? Because even if you are the most human-centered leader in the world, it is possible and even statistically likely that somebody on your team has had a negative experience in the past with speaking up and saying, I'm never going to do that again. Because in the qualitative aspects of our research, one of the things we asked when people were sharing these experiences, we said, well, how long ago was that? Oh, it was about 10 years ago. Well, uh, was was that negative experience of speaking up at this organization? No, no, it's another spe- another organization. But I'm never doing that again. So that's one way to think about this. And the other is discounting the future, which is people are more likely to underestimate the future benefits of speaking up and to overweight the, uh, the what could potentially happen. And so they just keep quiet. So today we're going to share with you four elements of our seven step process for building a courageous culture. So it starts with navigating the narrative. And that's really getting grounded in your how you feel about speaking up yourself because your team is watching. Next, creating clarity, which is clarity around that you really do want ideas and clarity around where a, what a good idea would accomplish. Three, cultivating curiosity, proactively going out and inviting people to contribute their ideas and responding with regard. How do you respond when people share an idea even if it's not an idea that you can't use. So from there, we're not going to hang out in these the rest of today, but we cover in our book, how do you practice the principle? How do you scale these ideas? How do you galvanize the genius and and bring them throughout your organization and building an infrastructure for courage? You know, we have a lot of HR folks on. This is your onboarding, your performance appraisal systems, your rewards and recognitions, and how you integrate that into all of the work that you're doing to build culture. So let's start with the first element of this, which is navigating the narrative. Now, as we do this, I would like to take you back. Have you ever had a time in your career where you thought you were leading quite well, and as it turns out, you were not having the impact that you hoped you would? I had just been promoted to my very first executive role in human resources, and it was concurrent with a merger at Verizon. So all of the players were new. I had all new executive stakeholders to support. Half my team was new. I had a new boss. And because life is sometimes messy, I was going through a divorce, and I was navigating a new life in a new role as a single mom. Now, as HR professionals, you know that this is illegal, but you also know people get worried. And I was worried. I thought people would say, hmm, this is probably not a great time to promote her. She's got to be under a lot of stress with all this going on. Or how is she going to manage the travel from Baltimore to Manhattan with a little boy at home? Or she's awfully young. They've got a lot of runway here. Let's just wait till things settle down for her and promote her later on. So I kept very quiet. Now, my very first project in this new role was to build a diversity strategy for the new merged organization. And I thought, hey, let's pull together a diversity council. We'll bring people together from different race, age, gender, sexual orientation, from all over the company, sales, marketing, customer service, IT. And the idea is that we would invite them to share their personal experiences and let that inform our strategy, help us to understand what policies, resources we needed to add into the, the build. And it was going so well. The diversity council members were really opening up and sharing their personal experiences. And it was so valuable for us to understand what was really happening. For example, Juan said, you know, the other day I was in a management offsite 
and uh, at a hotel, one of our senior leaders, who, by the way, has met me at least three times, walks into the door of the hotel, hands me his keys because he thought I was the valet. And Sharika says, you know, as a black woman, sometimes I'll sit in a meeting, I'll bring up an idea, people just keep talking right over me. And then the black guy, or the white guy sitting right next to me will share almost the exact same idea. Suddenly all eyes are on him and we're listening and thinking about what we, how we're going to execute. And Susan said, I'm a single mom. I work in a 24 by seven call center in the Bronx, New York. Our schedules change every three to four weeks. I cannot possibly keep reliable daycare in a situation like that. I am on stage four of our attendance plan and I am about to lose my job. And you guys, I really need this job. And we took all of that into consideration and came up with policy recommendations and resources and support tools and how to do better daycare. And it was three weeks before we were getting ready to present that strategy to the very senior team. Sharika walks into my office, picks up this picture from my desk, hands it to me and says, Karen, you are a fraud. I came by your office the other day to drop off some papers. Your assistant let me in. There are pictures all over your desk of you and a little boy. And no man, you are a single mom. All this time, you invited us to tap into our personal experiences to inform our strategy. And not once does it occur to you that your experiences are relevant here too. The truth is executives like you are afraid to be who you are at work. And if you're afraid, we're afraid. And Sharika was absolutely right. I was afraid to be who I was at work. And I was not the only one. Strategy was incomplete. And I did know it. So I got everybody together on an emergency conference call the next morning. And I said, hey, I have something to tell you. I'm a single mom. And they said, oh, yeah, we know. Sharika already told us. And then we went back and we layered in executive storytelling, ways for for leaders to be more vulnerable, to share their experiences so that others could look and say, hey, she looks a lot like me. And if she could do that, maybe I can too. One year later, the entire diversity council was invited back to New York City for the impact that that strategy had had on our employee engagement results. And I am looking across the table and there is Sharika and she is smiling because she knew I was no longer a fraud because I wasn't afraid. So as we start with navigating the narrative, it's all about becoming and being the courageous leader that your team needs to see. So in that moment, Sharika was the courageous leader. Karen wasn't operating authentically with her own values and what she was trying to do there. And that has an impact on our team because everybody's got a story. When we talk about a courageous culture, there is a paradox. In a courageous culture, it actually takes less courage because if everybody, if people like us raise our hand and are speaking up and solving problems, it doesn't take as much courage to do that. But somebody has to go first. Somebody has to lead the way. And of course, that's the leader's job. Leaders go first. The stories that your people, your teams, your leaders' teams, everybody is coming with, there are so many things happening in those rooms. People have illnesses in their family. They're celebrating things. They're, you know, There's financial concerns, losses, joys, all of those elements. And part of creating a truly courageous culture is acknowledging the humanity, the story, and navigating the narratives that are in those rooms. 
And there are so many different ways to do it. But one of the first ways that we like to tap into our own moments of courage is to just ask. And we did this when we were writing Courageous Cultures, and we started asking other leaders this, and the answers have been phenomenal. We want to ask you this as well. So if you could, open your chat bar, get your fingers on the keyboard, and we want to ask you, what has been your most courageous act at work? Anytime in your career. Go ahead, type that in, just the the tweetable, the the short version of that. You know, I stood up to a bully. I let go of a, a high performer who was toxic and abusive. Maybe I confronted a senior leader on a policy decision that didn't align with our values. What was one of your most courageous moments at work? And at the end of the program, uh, when we're doing Q&A and things, we'll ask our host to share some of those courageous moments that come out. So we're going to keep going, but I want to encourage you, please take a moment and chat, chat in there one of your most courageous acts at work. And let's inspire one another with those. Okay, so one way uh, to do this, this is a very uh, practical tool that we actually discovered by accident. Uh, we were facilitating a strategic planning offsite, and who was in the room were the presidents of the brand of this particular company and the people who were in the box nine succession planning to move in to those roles. So pretty senior crowd. And we were trying to collaborate across these five different brands and uh, work on pulling together a strategy that would then be deployed through the entire organization. And have you ever had the feeling that you're like, I just don't feel like people are having the conversation that really needs to be ha happening here. So I had that feeling. So I called a quick break. I put an index card in front of everyone's seat and I asked them when they came back to write uh, a H on the front of the card and put their biggest hopes for this project and an F on the back for their biggest fears. I quickly collected them and I just read them out loud. Now, the hopes were all the things you would anticipate in a meeting like this. It was all of the reasons why we were doing this project that were, were plastered all over the white easel sheets around the room. What was fascinating was the fears. I do not trust that my peers in this room are going to do what they say they're going to do. I suspect that I'm the only one who's really bought in to this. I don't think everyone's really going to go back and execute. I think this is going to be a waste of time because I'm not sure everybody's fully committed to this project. Almost every fear was exactly the same. Now imagine if we had just gone forward with our merry planning on this project with everybody having those fears. They wouldn't have gone back and executed. They wouldn't have put that as a priority, most important thing, strategy for their team. They would have been waiting and watching and seeing, is anybody actually going to do this? We had to have that conversation first. So that's what we call a fear forage. And in our Courageous Cultures programs, one of the things that we often do is tap into people's hopes and fears around the strategic direction where things are headed. Because if you don't start there, then anything else you're going to do to invite problem solving, to cultivate curiosity, will not have the impact that you want. Okay. So we want to share some tools with you so that you can share with your leaders to help them in their journey of leading courageously. These are all free. They are very limited time, though. So let me show you the resources. First is the art of lead leading courageously. This is a uh, a two-part self-reflection assessment to tap into one's personal courage first and then take a look at how you're using and how your leaders might be using some of the tools that we're going to be sharing with you as we continue on today. And then uh, the second half after the personal courage, we get to the Courageous Cultures Incubator Guide. And we're going to share some of the tools from this guide with you. But this is something that your leaders can use to walk their teams through idea generation to ask specific questions that will help to surface practical, relevant answers and solutions in a very short amount of time. We have run these uh, incubator guides with organizations all over the world, and it's been so cool to see what people come up with when you ask the right questions. Those are available for you and your leaders to use with their teams. To do that, to get those tools, you're going to go to KiwiLive.com. You're going to type in the keyword engage in the white box there. 
and then it will uh, ask you for your email, for your address, and it will send you those tools. You'll also have an opportunity, if you'd like to, to say yes, that you'd like to get uh, our weekly uh, updates of more practical leadership tips. If you say no or leave it blank, you won't hear from us in that regard again. But all the tools are there. Kiwi Live, here's the thing. Very limited time offer. Three hours after the end of this webinar, you get a bonus by being here live. So we've got another program that that's got to reset for. So about three, three and a half hours after the end of the program, go to Kiwi Live, keyword engage, and you'll get those. If you are watching this uh, on a recording and you really want them, you can email us info at letsgrowleaders.com. We will still help you out with those tools. But if you want them the easy way, there's your answer. All right. KiwiLive.com. Let's keep going. Okay. So we have been talking about navigating the narrative, which is the first aspect of our seven step process for building a courageous culture. Now, as we move into the second element, I would like to invite you to think back to your senior year in high school. Do you remember being sensitive to all the last times? The last big game, the last show you were in, the last summer night before you and your friends all went your separate ways. Well, it was my son Ben's last marching band game, the senior, his senior year of high school. And he invited me to come take pictures, which is great job for me. I love my son and I love photography. So I am pumped to go do this. Now, of course, I was busy as always, so I'm getting there just in time, and I pull my truck into the school parking lot, and I look down the hill, and I can see that the marching band is already starting to come around the track, so I throw my heels in the back of my truck. I go running down the grassy field around the concession stand. The air is filled with that thick scent of fall leaves and nacho cheese, And I set up my tripod right at the 50-yard line with a big telephoto lens. Now, I've got to tell you, I got some great ones. I got a picture of of my big band and this tiny little piccolo player he had a crush on marching right in front of one another. And they gave each other the sweetest little look, and I zoomed right in. I got a picture of his reflection in the bell of the mellophone. So I I went home and I uploaded everything to my computer and I started doing my magic. And by magic, I mean, I put it into a PowerPoint presentation and I waited for Ben to get home. Ben walks in the door from the Double T Diner after the game and I say, Ben, you are going to love these pictures. Watch this. Oh, cute. How about this one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mom, that one's great. All right, all right, Benjamin, this one. Mom, did you get a picture of the guitar? Benjamin, you play mellophone. No, in the last 16 measures. The entire band marches into a formation of a giant electric guitar. Did you get a picture of that? Nope. I had completely missed the big picture. Has that ever happened to you? You're working hard. Your team is working hard. There is not a motivation problem. And somehow you're not focused on what matters most. Imagine if, if Ben had said to me, Mom, the most important thing, get a picture of that guitar. What would I have done differently? Certainly wouldn't have been down at that 50-yard line, no big lens, just up in the stands doing a panoramic. So when it comes to creating a courageous culture, if you want people focused on bringing their very best ideas in the direction that you need great ideas, stay focused on creating clarity because one good conversation about expectation can prevent 14. Why didn't you conversations? So when we talk about the next step for building a courageous culture, it's it's clear. It's being clear about two things. 
clear that you really want people's ideas and clear this is where we're headed strategically. This is where we really need a great idea. We, When we were testing the tools that we're sharing with you today, when we were writing Courageous Cultures, we did this in two ways. One where we went out and said, bring us any ideas to improve the business. And then others where we said, here is a strategic area that the company is really headed in. What great ideas do you have in this area? Hands down, when we created more clarity, that's where the quality of ideas improved exponentially. So that's the step, navigating the narrative, creating clarity. Now let's talk about moving on to the third step, cultivating curiosity. And as we're cultivating curiosity, what kind of ideas are we looking for? Well, this is an apple, obviously. It's specifically, though, it is my favorite kind of apple. It's called a Honeycrisp apple. The reason that it is my favorite, and it's the favorite of 40% of the U.S. market, is that it has this amazing crunch, this perfect taste that's tart and sweet. Uh, it's just a wonderful apple to eat. It almost didn't happen, though. 1977, the University of Minnesota agricultural team grew the first one of those trees, hybridized and, and grew this tree. Well, they, all, they threw it away because they said it'll never make it through the winter. Until two years later, a guy by the name of David Bedford joined the team, 1979, and he's out in the orchard, and he found a clone of the tree that had survived. Taste that apple and says, holy cow, this apple is so good. We have to, we have to get this thing to market. Well, it had some other challenges. Uh, they were more expensive to grow because birds had a preference for them too. So given an orchard, they'd go after these apples. The trees needed more calcium in the soil than a normal tree. And the Honeycrisp is kind of a diva of apples. When you pick it from the tree, you have to let it rest for a week and a half before you can put it in the crates and ship it off to the, the stores. Or normal apples, you can just pick them and ship them. All of those factors added up to make the Honeycrisp a far more expensive apple. And back in the early 1980s, the apple market was very commodified. Red ones, green ones. The idea of selling a more expensive apple was very foreign to most growers. But he said, what if? And the rest is history. It revolutionized the apple industry. And now there's a race to grow better and bigger apples. People also pay two to four times as much for Honeycrisp apple as they do other apples. Why do we share that with you? Because it's not a revolution. It's not a brand new idea. It's not a new kind of food. It's not a, even a new fruit. It's an apple, but it's a better apple. It's what we call a micro innovation. And so as we cultivate curiosity, we want to ask questions that are going to help to surface the majority of the kinds of innovations and solutions that are out there, which are honey crisp ideas, the micro innovations. Okay, so one way to do this is to ask uh, courageous questions. And a courageous question differs from a how can we do better question in a couple of ways. It is specific and it assumes that improvement is possible. So let me give you a couple of examples. One of our favorites uh, comes from uh, Don Yeager, who uh, runs a uh, contact center company called Mural. And he, and I've known Don for, for 10 years, and he has been consistently asking his teams this question. What's one policy of ours that just sucks? Now, what's fascinating about this is that Don is the COO. He makes or endorses these policies. So he is assuming that improvement is policy possible. And he knows that his frontline agents on the phones are hearing complaints from customers that they would interpret that way. So he's, he's asked that question. And what he's found by just asking for one is that that makes it easy. Well, you really want to know, Don? I'll let you, I'll tell you. And then he says, thank you. What else? And now he's into a conversation. Another example is what is one issue that uh, could derail this project if we don't address it? Uh, it's specific. I'm just asking about one issue. And I am assuming that there is something that could potentially get in the way of what we think success looks like here. Another is what is the greatest obstacle to your productivity right now? And then, so when you think about this, uh, you know, there's lots of, you know, lots of specific and vulnerable questions that you can ask. Start with where do you need a great idea? And then find 
courageous questions that you can ask. It's the simplest way you can do to start cultivating curiosity. Uh, another t- technique, this one we also discovered by accident. I was on a walk with my sister, Jill Herr, and she is the director of rehab at Wellspan Hospital in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And uh, I was telling her about our research and telling her about some of the techniques we were developing. And she says, Karen, I think we do this. I said, oh, please, please, what what do you do? And she says, whenever we have a really big strategic decision to make or we're implementing something new, we always invite one member of our team to only act on behalf of the patient. So what this looks like is if Joe is normally the director of IT and it's his turn to be the patient, Joe isn't allowed to talk about IT stuff. He's only allowed to say, what would the patient do if they were sitting in this meeting? So she said they were implementing a new scheduling system and it was an internal scheduling system. The problem that this was to solve is that my sister Jill would find she was sending her team into do rehab and they would find an empty room because the patient would be often testing. And it was creating a real frustration and destroying productivity. So they were implementing the schedule to provide more transparency so people knew where the patients were and they could see and re- move their schedules around. So Joe from IT is listening to this and says, I'd like to know my schedule too. And she said, everyone in the room went, oh, that's not going to work. And he said, wait, I get it. This is a hospital. It's not going to be completely accurate. There are emergencies. But right now I have zero visibility into my schedule. If I had some sense, even if it was 80% right, I would feel so much more sense of control. I already feel so out of control. I have cancer. My wife feels like she's got to be here all the time just in case there's a test that comes back or there's an important conversation to have. We've got little kids at home. This is just not easy for me. And everyone listened to that and they decided to implement what they call transparent scheduling. And she's like, it's not perfect, but it has had a substantial improvement on their patient satisfaction stores. So that's what we call the patient perspective. Doesn't need to be a hospital. It could be your customer's perspective. It could be the perspective of somebody in the other department. It could be an employee perspective. How can you have someone Think about your strategic problem only from that lens as they sit in your meetings. Another technique that we use is called own the ugly. And this is just four strategic questions. So you start with clarity. Where do you really need a great idea? So maybe it's with regard to our diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives, or with regard to um, helping people support their mental health while they're working from home. You ask these questions. What are we underestimating? Meaning, what haven't we thought about this problem? What's got to go? What do we need to stop doing in order to focus on this and really make this a priority? Where are we losing? Where are we losing the competition? Who's doing this better? Where are we losing people from a retention perspective? And why? This is our favorite. Where are we missing the yes? So when we work with organizations implementing and helping them build a courageous culture, one of the things that we will do is help them take their strategic initiatives and then have these conversations. And you can put people in groups and give one the U and one the G, one the L, one the Y, or you can have everybody go through the process. From there, you are surfacing a lot of ideas and thinking of new ways to think about the problem. From there, once you get all that, because you have more ideas you know what to do with when you go through that process, I promise you, the next thing you can do is use our idea method. And so this is our idea method, and we teach people on how to vet and choose better ideas and how to position their ideas. I, why is this idea interesting? Meaning, how is this solving the strategic problem where we said we really need ideas? Why is this strategically aligned with where we're headed? D, is it doable? Particularly important question right now because, right, there's most companies we're working with, we find, you know, they're just trying to figure out what needs to happen in the next six months. So is this something we could pull off right now? 
E, is it engaging? This is where you're teaching your team to think about stakeholders. Who else else they need to involve in this? And A, what are a couple of recommended first actions or next steps with regard to this idea? Interesting, doable, engaging actions. All right. So let's take a breath there and look at where we've been. We've navigated the narrative, started with our own stories and helping identify and surface the stories in the room where people are coming from, our own relationship to courage, grounding there. Then we got clear, creating clarity. What is a good idea going to do? Where do we really need one? Then we cultivated curiosity. Karen just shared a number of different tools that you and your leaders can use to surface the ideas that are there in your team. All of that is a great start to creating a courageous culture. And without this fourth and final element that we're going to share today, it can all fall apart and you won't get the culture you're after. We were doing some work with a large financial institution who had a really sophisticated way for getting ideas from every corner of the organization, frontline on up. They were receiving hundreds of ideas every month. The executive in charge of the program, we were talking with him and he said, you know, what's interesting is that half of the ideas we receive, we're already doing, already been implemented. We said, wow, you must have, uh, your employees must feel very heard. He said, no, our internal pulse scores, our surveys are not showing that. We said, okay, well, how are you going back and telling those folks, hey, listen, your idea was so good, it's already being used. And he said, oh, gosh, we're not going back and doing that. We're not closing that loop. We probably should do that. Well, yes. I mean, if you think about what's happening in the mind of that person who took the time to say, yeah, I've got a thought. Here it is. It submitted it. And from their perspective, it went into a black hole. They never heard anything. Well, now it's just reinforced all of that, those data and research findings that we shared at the beginning of the program. They're, they don't really care. They're stuck in their ways. Nothing's going to change. Nothing's, nothing substantial is going to happen. And because of the research that Karen shared with you earlier, the psycho- psychology, they're less likely to ever share anything in the future. The antidote to that, regardless of the kind of ideas we're receiving, is what we call respond with regard. This is how you ensure momentum, a consistent flow of ideas and problem solving. Responding with regard just has three steps. As we are receiving ideas that we're responding with gratitude, with information, and then an invitation. Gratitude, simply saying thank you. Thank you for thinking about how we could be better information, and this depends on the kind of idea that you received, and then an invitation to continue thinking, to continue contributing. Let's take a look at what this looks like. A couple different situations. There are four different scenarios you might run into. Uh, You receive an idea that's already implemented, like our, our big financial institution. All right, well, let's say thank you, and then explain the information stage, where and how the idea is in use, and who they might talk with to learn more. And then invitation hey, that was so good. What else do you have? Here's where we could really use a great idea. What if the idea is incomplete? You get an idea that mm, it's they were missing something. They didn't have some strategic information. They didn't understand something. All right. Hey, thank you for thinking about how we can get better. Here's some additional information uh, or some obstacles or a challenge or what have you. And then the invitation love for you to think through those things and resubmit your idea with that additional context. I think you've got something that could work there. Or perhaps the idea is ready to be trialed and tested. Again, the thank you, this one's the easiest one. Hey, your information is here's where that's going to happen. And if it's possible, how you might be a part of it. Love to get your thoughts on this topic. And finally, there are ideas that we're not going to be able to use. So when you get an idea that's not going to move forward, Can we share, hey, thank you for thinking about how we can be better. I appreciate you thinking. Uh, What is it that made this idea less usable? Is it not strategically aligned? Is there additional information? What can we add and let them know why we're not going to be able to do something with this idea either right now or maybe ever, and then invite them to continue thinking? The more that we're able to do that, the more people feel valued, they feel heard, that you genuinely do want their ideas, the more likely they are to contribute, and the better they're going to get at contributing meaningful ideas like using the idea model 
that have legs that are strategically relevant and have been thought through in terms of action steps, stakeholders, and agency. So that's responding with regard, and it's the critical piece to close this loop and create a virtuous, virtuous feedback loop to your courageous culture. Recalling again that the paradox of a courageous culture is that you need less daily courage once it's up and running. It's what people like us do. We raise our hand on behalf of the customer, on behalf of employee experience, efficiencies, and processes. And that's at the heart of a courageous culture. So we covered navigating the narratives, creating clarity, cultivating curiosity, responding with regard today. There is a dance between clarity and curiosity in all of these steps. You you will have seen that weave through, and that continues in the steps to come. So that's where we're going to wrap up today. We invite you to connect with us. A number of ways for you to do that. We've got the blog at letsgrowleaders.com. I run a podcast, leadershipwithoutlosingyoursoul.com. Karen runs a LinkedIn video blog series called Asking for a Friend. It's live uh, or it's available every Friday at 1130 a.m. on the East Coast and around the world. And uh, we would love to connect with you and answer any questions that you might have. But we have a chance to answer questions right now as well. All right. So what questions have come in? Hey, thanks, uh, David and Karen. It's lovely. And I think... Uh, it's, a, it's a new framework to look at culture, uh, which you provided. And I think I need to order the book immediately. Uh, <laughs> as the questions come in, I've got a couple of questions when I was listening to you. You talked about uh, FOSU, uh, nice term, by the way. Uh, and uh, I was reading this uh, Netflix book. I mean, Netflix is, of course, one of the examples of great culture uh, there. And they, I think, actively uh, encourage uh, questioning, you know, there, right? But I might not be in a company like that, you know. How, how, how do I do that? How do I start with that kind of question? You know, Netflix is actively en- encouraging that questioning for everything there, you know, uh, very honest feedback. But not every company is like that. How, how do I start with that in a yeah. company? So an important place to start is here. You know, if if you had an idea where you really believed it would make things better, you know, and you positioned it well, do you think your manager would want to hear it? And so here's, you've got an idea and you say, dear manager, I have an idea that would be, I think is going to help improve our team productivity, or I have an idea that's going to create some cost savings, or I have an idea that's going to improve the employee experience. Let me tell you, this is why I think it's strategically aligned with where we're headed. I, interesting. Here's why it's doable. I know we can pull this off because of this. Here's who else I think might need to be involved in this. I've already checked with HR and they think it's a good idea. I've checked with our finance. They said it wouldn't cost that much. Engaging. And A, here's a recommended next step, a key action that we would take. Now, if you positioned an idea with your manager like that, Unless they are, you know, a psychopath, they are, they may not use the idea, but they're certainly not going to be like, why is this guy wasting my time telling me these ideas? They're going to see you as a, a person who cares about the business and is thinking critically about ways to improve. So and that's one way is to get, um, you know, practical with how you're positioning your ideas. And so that's as you're positioning your ideas. The other half of the equation is how are you receiving ideas? And so are you asking, even if you're in a culture that doesn't support that, you can create a culture on your team. We call it a cultural oasis, where even if you're in a a desert culture, you can create that pocket of nourishing and and positive and affirming and, and one that really wants to hear people's ideas and questions and thoughts so that you can do the best work together as a team. You know, it's interesting, uh, right before we're in the middle of this very big build uh, for a food services uh, company that has asked us to not only train their leaders, but to train the people on the manufacturing floor on how to ask one another courageous questions, how to create, support one another in creating an environment of psychological safety. And these are, we're not doing anything fancy, but if you are that deliberate and sending that message. So I think that, you know, no matter where you are in the organization, say, ask the clarity, curiosity question. Where do I think we, we need to improve the business here? 
And what is one courageous question I could start asking people to collect other people's perspectives on this idea? And if people share their ideas, respond with regard. Two follow-up questions on that quickly. So do you think, um, based on your uh, research and, and your experience, uh, is, do you see a difference in national cultures affecting the company cultures? You know, some cultures are more direct. You know, Maybe the, the Dutch might be the extreme of, of direct being direct there, right? And the Japanese might be the other extreme. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. The, but do you see any difference in that uh, Yes, there are certainly those cultural differences. Absolutely. And so what we recommend for leaders as you're, as you're navigating this conversation is you're not going to change those fundamental values that people have grown up with and, and are approaching their work with. And they are doing good for them. All of those different cultures have those elements. There's a positive aspect to them. Our job is to bring that positive aspect into the business culture that we're building for our teams. And so when you ask a question like when you say, what's one thing that if we don't address it is going to derail this this project? Um, if you have a direct culture you're working with, you'll get the answers more readily. If you have a more of a face saving or an indirect or a regard for authority, I don't want to make people look bad. You might have to have the preliminary conversation that says, uh, if we really care about not making one another or anybody look bad, the way that we'll do that is we're going to tap into that value. And now we're going to bring it to bear in this conversation by saying, we need to answer this question. That's the way that we achieve what's important. Yeah. And in the book, we go through a variety of really specific techniques about how to do this, depending on what culture you're in, what kind of people you're, you're dealing with, their past experiences, the level of FOSU. You know, for example, one of the things we teach is visible anonymity. And what that is, is you're, you're asking questions in a way that people can see that other people are contributing, but they don't necessarily know who's contributing what. So, for example, the index card situation that I did, you know, asking people, everybody could see that everybody turned in a card, but they didn't know who said what. And so in a culture where people are like, I don't know if it's appropriate to speak up. Everybody's doing this. So I think that that feels safer to, to us. You know, we did some extensive work in Southeast Asia a couple of years ago, and uh, we were taking uh, you know, some some of these tools. One of the things that we found in working with groups is you needed to break it down and make who you were sharing the ideas with smaller. So rather than going to the whole team and say, okay, who has an idea? And in some circumstances, the men would speak up and the women would hold back. And, you know, so, okay, turn to the person next to you. And in, in those circumstances, usually the women were sitting next to a woman and the man were sitting. There. So turn to the person next to you. And then you ask one courageous question. What is one idea you have about this? Okay. And so now, now that feels way less intimidating. So I think you have to there that we've given a variety and a range of tools and you can pull the tools that will work best for your particular, your culture. Right. It absolutely makes sense, you know, and 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 uh, building this whole culture of courageous culture. I mean, if I'm not a manager or I don't have a position of authority, uh, you know, can I bring about that changes? You know, someone just asked that question. So uh, how do I? I'm just a. I would say that the first level of employees, you know, level one employee. How how do right. how do we get started there? Yeah, we have, a, I'll let David tell this story, but we have a great uh, story in this book uh, where we were working with a, a manager in England and he, he built what we call a cultural oasis. And this is one of David's favorite stories. So I'm going to let him tell it. <laughs> so he had a passion for positive culture in his organization. And uh, he was not even in human resources, uh, that branch, that department. He was an engineer and really cared about it. And so he was at a meeting and he said, I, this is what I'd like to do. And he got approval to at least try. They said, yeah, you can go ahead. So when we said, so what advice do you have for somebody who was in your shoes? He said, my first piece of advice, find the others. He found two other people who had some similar values and cared about creating a positive culture the way that he did. And the three of them founded this community of practice in the organization, which is now 400 plus strong. 
uh, and and just doing amazing work and transformative work and has so much buy in uh, and is really transforming the culture for those folks. So finding the others and starting where you are and being I mean, it's cliche, but to be the be the courageous person, invite people's ideas, ask them for their ideas, respond with regard and be that culture. It starts somewhere. And so leaders go first. You don't have to have a title to be a leader. You can start doing that yourself. Yeah. In chapter six of the book, I have a a big case study from the time, some time that I spent, uh, I was at Verizon. I was uh, leading a 2200 person sales team and we, and I won't give it away because I want you to buy the book, but there's 2200 person sales team. AT&T had exclusive rights to sell the iPhone. Verizon did not have rights to sell the iPhone. I had a completely demoralized sales team and they were like, Lady, go back to HR. There's nothing you can do. One year later, after implementing some of these processes and getting courageous and practicing the principle and doing the right thing and scaling, we were leading the nation in sales and revenue. And we had won the customers, uh, the president's award for customer growth. Still without being able to sell the iPhone at that point in time. So, and I didn't have a particularly courageous boss. I hope he's not listening. I did not have a particularly courageous boss at that time. But, you know, I started with, oh, well, let's just do a pilot. Let's make it easy. I never came like, oh, we're going to completely shift the strategy. You just start doing it. And when the results start to change, you will gain support. And, it, at, you know, during that process, so I don't talk about this part in the book, but people were sending their managers and other directors to come and watch and go into my stores and watch what people were doing because they wanted to be able to emulate that. And that went and we were doing so, just experimenting with new ideas. So I think that's the thing. Results by freedom. But you don't have to go out and say, I'm going to build a courageous culture. Just start small. Figure out what area you need a great idea. Go ask a courageous question. Go do a little pilot and prove that it works. And by the way, we recommend the same strategy, even if you're the CEO. Don't announce we're doing a courageous culture. Start doing it. I'll keep that in mind. Uh, (laughs) And I think there's no lack of courageous uh, people. So just taking a few um, notes of uh, your question, which you asked, uh, some of the courageous actions which people have done. Uh, Let me just uh, read out some of these uh, ones. Stood out for uh, stood up for an employee being harassed. You know, confronted mm-hmm. a leader for harassing a peer of mine. To, a couple of people have said that. You know, uh, stood up to senior HR leader who was a bully. You know, um, stood up to a bully with a uh, and who had created a toxic workplace and quit my job. Yeah, I, I would have suggested you stick stick to the job, uh, but yeah. Uh, uh, by making uh, so interesting, by making myself vulnerable before the stuff, basically sharing stuff. You, know? mm-hmm. I, I, you mentioned something about uh, Karen. You had mentioned about that. You know? yeah. yeah. Shame on that senior HR leader for being a bully. We should know better as HR people. <laughs> uh, but that just shows that humans are humans, and you know, some th- there's real folks who everywhere in every department that you go, and so we just need to be cognizant that that is true. And that people have these negative experiences and make it easy. Don't just say, hey, I have an open door. Come through it. Proactively go out and ask people for those ideas. And start small. I think the idea which you gave, you know, you don't need to announce it uh, in, in a big way. You yeah. know, it, it might certainly be scary for some people. You know, Karen is coming with a courageous culture. You know, I don't yeah. want to disturb the apple cart there. Right. Uh, but uh, I think that's a great idea. Uh, thanks, uh, David and Karen. You know, it's a wonderful session. And I'm sure there are lots more material which you have in the book. And uh, I'm sure and I'll encourage everyone to uh, take up the offer and, and go for it. Um, All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you, David. And thanks, everyone. You will get the recorded session uh, post this. And our pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye.